Thank you very much, Juan, and uh, thanks to Vivek for inviting me to this symposium. This is now the second uh, trip I've made to Barcelona uh, in my life, and uh, this, both times this year. And I've grown very fond of your warm and uh, friendly people and wonderful city. Well, um, this morning what I'm going to do is to describe uh, some research that began in my laboratory just a few years ago, uh, but I'll focus on a new effort uh, that was uh, the, the result of one terrific postdoc, Yu Song Guo, that relates to how proteins achieve localization to two uh, surfaces that have uh, in epithelial cells whose assembly has not yet been investigated very much, at least not by cell biologists. Uh, but to set the stage for the general area of the research in my lab, let's have a look at uh, a generic view of traffic pathways in eukaryotic cells. And I'd like to emphasize one uh, important aspect uh, of the architecture of this pathway and uh, how proteins are sorted within cells. So um, George Pilati recognized in the 1960s that eukaryotic cells, particularly those engaged in secretion, uh, have a number of intracellular compartments that communicate with each other by a flow of vesicles, uh, which he imagined carry content from one station to the next, ultimately to be secreted at the cell surface. Uh, what he didn't appreciate, but which, uh, which uh, became uh, important in subsequent years, is that the communication among these organelles uh, presents a problem because membranes are, at least to a first approximation, two-dimensional fluids. Proteins are free to diffuse within the plane of the membrane. Uh, and vesicles that convey molecules, membrane proteins, from one st step to the next, would, if they uh, had free reign, scramble the contents of membranes. That is, that uh, organelles would quickly lose their identity if, unless there were some special rules that regulated the capture of only the right kinds of molecules into transport vesicles. And so one of the lessons that's come from work in my laboratory, Vivek's laboratory, many other laboratories around the world, is that uh, this is achieved uh, by a selective capture of cargo molecules. In many instances, I believe possibly in all instances, by a s different sets of cytoplasmic coat protein complexes that uh, polymerize on the surface of a donor membrane and recognize cargo molecules by interacting with sorting signals and capturing only those proteins that are destined to be transported. One major uh, vehicle for this traffic is a, uh, a path that we uh, discovered in yeast mediated by a set of cytoplasmic proteins that assemble to form a coat that we call COP2. I'll have very little to say about this because I'm going to focus on a relatively underexplored area of traffic, even more complex, in the sorting of molecules at the trans-Golgi apparatus. Uh, but the story uh, that I'll tell you begins, uh, as much of the work in my lab has in recent years, on uh, an, a quite interesting example of sorting in mammalian cells mediated by COP2. So let's have a look at a kind of a superficial view of the assembly of the COP2 cage and how it works. There are a series of interactions mediated by a small GTP binding protein called SAR1 and a set of uh, cytoplasmic coat subunits that recognize, bind to, and begin to capture cargo molecules that are going to be conveyed into a vesicle. This is consummated by a very interesting cage-like structure formed by two SEC proteins in a heterotetrameric complex called SEC1331, which was discovered by Bill Balch to self-assemble into a quite unusual cube octahedral structure uh, that imposes its shape on the membrane and by uh, completion of polymerization uh, captures proteins um, by fission uh, into a vesicle that then is delivered to the next station in the pathway. Now, we've been studying this for many years and, uh, in yeast, uh, but about four or five years ago, I had an interesting email exchange with a, a developmental neurobiologist at Johns Hopkins by the name of David Ginty, who presented a conundrum uh, to my lab. He said he found, a graduate student in his lab, Jenna Merta, had found that a mutation in one of four copies of uh, the gene SEC24, 
uh, produces an unusual, rather profound defect in neural tube closure. Now we know SEC24 is the subunit of the COP2 coat that is responsible for recognizing and capturing cargo molecules. We showed in yeast, and imagine the same would be true in mammalian cells, that each of the four paralogs would be responsible for a distinct cohort of cargo molecules. And so uh, when Ginty presented me with this uh, strange observation, I suggested that perhaps SEC24B was the paralog responsible for the capture of membrane proteins that may be necessary for neural tube closure. Now, now, so then the question is what kinds of cargo molecules might need to be conveyed to the neural epithelial cell surface to achieve this uh, first event in brain development? Um, well, uh, Ginty pointed out to me that there is a, an important pathway uh, that is populated by a small number of cell surface receptor molecules, including one that you've all heard of called frizzled. Uh, there are two paralogs uh, of the six uh, in mammals that are expressed in the brain. And when one knocks out both paralogs of frizzled uh, in the brain, uh, the same uh, phenotype is reproduced that was seen in the SEC24B chain terminating mutation, a very profound defect in the closure of the neural epithelium. Now, uh, underlying this uh, process called convergent extension, where the neural epithelium stretches and cells migrate to closure, is a, an organization of the cell that is referred to as planar cell polarity. That is true of all epithelia, uh, but it is less well understood at a cellular level, at least by cell biologists. Most cell biologists who study uh, epithelial cells are um, actively involved in understanding how this organization is achieved along a plane perpendicular to the plane of the epithelium where proteins are distributed to an apical surface and others to a basal lateral surface largely by a protein sorting event that is achieved in the Golgi apparatus where some vesicles carrying content to the apical surface are sorted from those that deliver proteins to the basal lateral surface. But equally important and, yes, and yet less well understood is how in the same epithelia some molecules like frizzled are distributed to the distal surface by convention referred to as the distal surface uh, and this uh, convention relates to the organization of, of the epithelium in a drosophila fly wing. Uh, as opposed to other molecules, for example, a protein called Vangel 2, which is separated from frizzled and distributed to the proximal surface. Well, we became interested in Vangel 2 because Devin Jensen, a graduate student in my lab, figured out uh, through experiments that I don't have time to tell you that Vangel 2 is fairly specifically dependent on SEC24B for its packaging into COP2 vesicles and for transport to the Golgi apparatus. And obviously, if Vangel 2 doesn't leave the ER, it's never going to get to the cell surface, and therefore, planar cell polarity cannot be sustained. But we thought that um, it was likely, perhaps even more important, that uh, sorting to achieve this distribution to the two surfaces uh, would, by analogy to, uh, to sorting at the TGN, the trans-Golgi network, for sorting to the apical and basal lateral surface, uh, surfaces, might be achieved by specialized vesicles that would, ca uh, that would convey, for instance, uh, Vangel 2 to the proximal surface and convey frizzled to the distal surface. And so Yusan Guo in my lab decided to uh, focus very specifically on the question of how Vangel 2 achieves its localization at the cell surface and whether there might be some unique uh, coat protein complex uh, in the trans-Golgi that would achieve segregation of these two molecules to those two opposing surfaces. Our idea started with a general notion of how coat proteins assemble. There's a commonality among all of them. And here is one such example um, of, of a coat protein that's involved in traffic within the Golgi that was uh, studied in great depth by Jim Rothman uh, and Lelio, uh, and, and Lelio Orchi and uh, Vivek uh, some years ago. Uh, and that is uh, uh, Codimer COP1. Um, this coat is assembled uh, initially uh, by instructions uh, from an activated form of a G small GTPA, it's called ARF, uh, a small protein that's related to SAR1, which is involved in the COP2 coat. Uh, so 
we imagine that there would be um, an ARF or ARF-like protein that may uh, be involved in sorting at the trans-Golgi for segregation of Vangel II. And, and uh, our, our idea was motivated by the knowledge uh, that in mammalian cells, there are two dozen different ARF and ARF-like GTPases, a number of which are themselves localized to the trans-Golgi apparatus and where really nothing is known about what they may do. So here is a, a long list. You don't have to pay any attention to it other than to note that among the ARF and ARF-like GTPases, you see a number of them hang out in the Golgi, specifically in the trans-Golgi. And so what Yusong did was he established a, a cell line as a proxy for, uh, for epithelial cells. He used COS7 cells, for instance, or HeLa cells, uh, transfected, um, stably transfected with an HA tagged form of Vangel II under conditions where Vangel II is distributed uniformly about the cell surface. Unfortunately, there are no established cell lines that recapitulate planar cell polarity. So he started with such a cell and he asked, uh, can one identify uh, one, at least one, of the ARF or ARF-like GTPases as required for the traffic of Vangel II from the trans-Golgi to the cell surface? So a very simple experiment. He set up a stably transfected cell line, and one at a time, he knocked down, uh, using siRNA, uh, each of the several different uh, ARF GTPases. And I'll focus uh, for much of my talk on this one called ARF-RP1, very interesting, uh, very important GTPase, known to be essential in the mouse uh, with the phenotype of the knockout being an early embryonic lethal, but very little is known about what it may do. That one, among all of them uh, that are localized to the Golgi, when knocked down, showed a, a substantial delay in the traffic of HA-tagged Vangel II out of uh, a perinuclear structure that overlaps uh, entirely with a marker protein called Golgin 97 that is a known reporter of the trans-Golgi network. So clearly, uh, uh, this protein, ARF-RP1, uh, plays some important role in this uh, traffic event. Now, um, in examining uh, the C-terminal cytoplasmic tail of Vangel II, we noted a number of bits of information that are essential to its localization in the secretory pathway. Devin Jensen earlier noted sequences in the C-terminus that are essential for the export of Vangel II out of the endoplasmic reticulum, where mutations in these residues cause Vangel II to arrest early in its traffic. Uh, another sequence um, say, uh, appeared um, in uh, the C-terminus that struck uh, Yusong's attention, and that is a sequence that has been seen in other proteins that are transported basolaterally in epithelial cells. It resembles what is called a basolateral sorting signal with uh, two tyrosines, a phenylalanine, uh, and um, a, a very often uh, leucine residues in the, in the vicinity. So this sorting signal is known, for instance, to be responsible for the traffic of vesicular stomatitis virus. Uh, uh, in uh, transfected cells, and uh, Yusong decided to look at each of these residues to see if, uh, if mutated, they may affect the traffic of Vangel II uh, out of the Golgi apparatus, the same station that seems to be dependent on ARF RP1. I'll show you just one example of uh, the residues that are most important for this traffic event. So here is the se sequence, as you saw in the previous slide. Uh, what Yusong noted is that this tyrosine residue um, and the phenylalanine residue, even more importantly, one of the tyrosine residues and the phenylalanine residue, uh, one or the other, is really quite important in traffic. In this example, if you mutate both to alanines, uh, there is a, a virtual complete arrest of mutant Vangel II in the Golgi apparatus, once again aligned with the disposition of the reporter protein uh, Golgin 97. The most important of these two residues is the phenylalanine residue. That alone, when mutated to alanine, gives an equally uh, extreme block in traffic. And, and let me emphasize again, uh, this is quite unusual. Uh, this molecule, this Vangel II mutant protein, uh, is folded properly because it's left the endoplasmic reticulum, but it is very specifically arrested in the same compartment that we saw Vangel II arrest when uh, RP1 is uh, knocked down. 
Now, um, in the literature, one knows that basal lateral sorting signals are often recognized by one or another uh, of a set of so-called coat proteins. Actually, they are proteins that adapt clathrin uh, to envelop uh, membra pieces of membrane at various locations in the cell for traffic between the endosome and the cell surface. There are four or five such complexes called AP1, 2, 3, 4, and another one, 5, that show overall similarity and have uh, one or another subunit that is principally engaged in recognizing uh, and decoding a sorting signal. AP1, for instance, is known from work in various labs, principally Juan Bonifacino, to be required for traffic of some proteins out of the Trans-Golgi network, uh, and uh, where the, the event is mediated for some molecules, uh, uh, mediated by the mu1 subunit of this complex. AP2, on the other hand, is known to be responsible for receptor-mediated endocytosis at the cell surface, AP3 and 4 are more specialized in the, in the traffic of molecules uh, from the trans-Golgi to the endosome network. So, uh, Yusong decided to do a simple experiment to see which of these uh, coat complexes or other molecules may uh, be responsible for the traffic of Vangel 2 and may, be, may bind to this uh, basal lateral sorting signal. The first experiment that I'll show you is a very simple one where he took um, a GTP or GDP, mutant forms of, uh, of ARF RP1, immobilized them on beads, and then exposed them to a crude cytosol fraction under conditions where he may see selective binding of proteins. One example is shown here in the GTP activated form of ARF RP1, as opposed to the GDP inactive form, he saw a quite substantial and preferential recruitment of at least one of the subunits of AP1. And in other experiments, the other AP complexes did not bind under either condition to this immobilized form of ARF RP1. He then asked, uh, given this, if uh, AP1 is itself required for the traffic of Vangel 2 uh, out of the trans-Golgi apparatus. So he did the same experiment that you've seen with uh, ARF RP1, a knockdown experiment. Here is one a result of his showing that AP1 is itself also required for traffic of Vangel 2. You know the setup, HA Vangel 2, uh, trans stably transfected cells. When either of two different subunits of the AP1 complex is knocked down, uh, uh, Vangel 2 accumulates uh, once again aligned uh, uh, quite substantially in the, uh, the membrane marked by Golgen 97. Uh, the majority of cells show this arrest compared to mock transfected cells. And in contrast, when one knocks down one of the subunits of the AP3 complex, no arrest is seen above background. So armed with this, we were left with uh, two clues. One is AP1 is required for Vangel 2 traffic. The other is ARF RP1 is required. Now what about this basal lateral sorting signal? Is that particularly the tyrosine residue? Is that important for the, for the recruitment of AP1? So the next experiments, similar to um, ones that you saw before in a pull down, uh, involved taking an immobilized form of the mu subunit of AP1, which we believe to be the crucial one that recognizes uh, the C terminus of Vangel 2, immobilized uh, the mu subunit in comparison to just GST, and um, a lysates of cells transfected with HA tag forms of Vangel 2, either wild type or one or another mutation within this basal lateral sorting signal. So the first observation is very clear that wild type Vangel 2 binds quite nicely to immobilized AP1 uh, without binding under these conditions to just GST alone. And um, a deletion of the entire region virtually eliminates this binding. But more importantly, even just uh, the single tyrosine mutation, or more, uh, more um, importantly, the single phenylalanine residue reduces the binding of uh, mu AP1 uh, to Vangel 2 in this kind of a pull-down experiment. So that, that then sort of closes the circle for this kind of an experiment. It's clear that 
AP1 binds, it binds to the very residues that are required for the traffic of Vangel II, and it binds to, uh, uh, in some way uh, involving our, our P1. Uh, this, of course, was done with a crude extract, but it's possible to do this even with pure recombinant protein. So here we've purified a maltose binding protein fused, fused to the entire C terminus of Vangel II and mixed that pure protein uh, with a, a immobilized um, mu AP1. And the same results, as you saw before, are seen here. In the bound fraction, a wild type um, C terminus binds nicely to mu1. Uh, whereas the double mutant uh, doesn't bind at all. So a very clear effect that is uh, clearly also a direct effect, not merely an indirect effect. All right, now taking this to the next level of analysis, we sought to reproduce some of these binding events uh, in the context of a synthetic membrane. And we often in the lab use a very simple experiment to test how membrane proteins or peripheral membrane proteins are recruited dependent upon one another to the surface of a liposome. It's a very simple sucrose flotation experiment where one takes, in this case, liposomes formulated with a, a composition of phospholipids um, similar to the Golgi apparatus. And uh, these liposomes are extruded through a control pore filter so that they're about 300 nanometers in diameter. They're mixed in various combinations, as, as you'll see in a moment, uh, with pure recombinant proteins. And those proteins that adhere to the, to the vesicle uh, bind tightly enough so that they resist flotation on a sucrose density gradient. The sample is put at the bottom of the tube, subjected to ultracetification, uh, and the proteoliposome material floats to the top, can then be sampled and evaluated by SDS page. So here's one very simple experiment that shows that ARF RP1, um, when activated uh, by a non-hydrolyzable analog of GTP, is itself sufficient to recruit AP1 to the liposomes. So without uh, a an activating nucleotide, uh, ARF RP1 uh, binds uh, very poorly to the liposome, and even the little bit that's bound is insufficient to recruit any uh, AP1 complex. And this is an experiment with now pure recombinant, uh, or pure uh, 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 oligomeric AP1 complex, not just the mu subunit. Uh, on the other hand, if a low level of ARF RP1 is incubated with a, um, a non hydrolyzable analog, one now sees uh, the recruitment of AP1 to the surface of the liposome and uh, that um, uh, is increased on addition of more ARF RP1 to the, to the mixture. This data is quantified in the bottom. All right, now for really uh, two crucial experiments that seek to probe the specificity uh, of this reaction <clears throat> uh, and its dependence on the signal in the C terminus of Vangel II that we know to be uh, essential for the traffic of Vangel II in transfected cells. So here's a similar experiment to the one you just saw, but with a really uh, quite gratifying result. Now, the experiment involves taking the same liposome mixture, but now instead of just the two proteins, AP1 and RFRP1, uh, Yusong found that he could take the C terminus of Vangel II, uh, and just by itself, for some reason that we can't explain, it sticks to membranes. It's probably partially unfolded, and it adheres to these liposomes. So these uh, this fragment can then be added or not to the incubation. And in two crucial samples that you'll see now, he, in he included in the incubation either wild-type C-terminus of angle 2 or sorting mutant C-terminus of angle 2. So as before, um, as you saw before uh, in this incubation, AP1 is not recruited to liposomes uh, on, um, if ARF RP1, in this case GTP gamma S activated, is absent so a low background. On the other hand, AP1 is recruited, as you saw on the previous slide, dependent upon ARF RP1 in the second lane. Now, crucially, in the, same, in the presence of the same concentration of ARF RP1 and uh, AP1, the addition of wild-type Vangel II C terminus stimulates approximately threefold the recruitment of AP1 to this membrane. So that says that uh, that uh, piece of Vangel II somehow facilitates the interaction of ARF RP1 with uh, AP1. And importantly, 
if the control incubation is conducted in the presence of a, a, a point mutant, a sorting signal mutant fragment of Vangel II, the uh, stimulation in AP1 recruitment is reduced to background level. So um, the presence of the mutant Vangel II is, uh, 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 brings AP1 to the membrane uh, with no greater efficiency than in the absence of uh, the C terminus of angle two. So that says that there's some, something very s selective that has been recapitulated, uh, that recapitulates, at least in part, some of the requirements that we established in transfected cells. Now, uh, an even more subtle, but I think equally important control was to establish that ARF RP1 has some special role in this reaction. Uh, there are, as I said, 24 different ARFs or ARF-like GTPases. Is there something special about ARF RP1 that allows it uh, to uh, somehow facilitate AP1's interaction uh, with the sorting signal of Vangel 2, as opposed to another ARF GTPase? The classic ARF GTPase, also in the Golgi, called ARF1, likely involved in traffic earlier within the Golgi, um, may um, behave differently in this incubation. And so what uh, Yusong did was he purified recombinant form of uh, ARF1 and compared the efficiency of its recruitment uh, of AP1 to the membranes in the presence and absence of Vangel2 to the efficiency that you just saw in this slide um, that is achieved by ARF RP1. So the same kind of experiment that you've seen, but now we compare ARF1, uh, the classic ARF GTPase, to this more specialized ARF RP1. So the first two lanes basically reproduce the data that you saw on the previous slide, the addition uh, of activated uh, ARF RP1 uh, and the C terminus of Vangel2 recruits uh, AP1 to the membranes, uh, stimulation in this case about two and a half fold. But in parallel, a parallel incubation, where ARF RP1 is replaced by ARF1, there is no such stimulation on addition of the Vangel 2 C terminus. So uh, this experiment, I think, crucially distinguishes ARF1 from ARF RP1 in decoding the signal in the C terminus of Vangel 2. Right, let me put these together in the form of a, a simple model. Um, we imagine that uh, the um, ARF RP1 GTPase is locally activated by nucleotide exchange uh, at the trans-Golgi membrane. Perhaps a local exchange catalyst is there. Uh, this then serves as a landmark for the binding of AP1. AP1 binds to other GTPases in the Golgi. It binds to ARF1. Uh, but in this case, bound to ARF RP1, we imagine uh, that um, uh, a binding pocket may be exposed, a new binding pocket may be exposed that selectively recognizes the phenylalanine and tyrosine residues of the signal in uh, Vangel 2 to attract it and the complex now uh, uh, bound together by these uh, multiple interactions may organize laterally within the plane of the membrane either with or without clathrin to uh, concentrate cargo molecules that are destined for the uh, proximal surface of, the, uh, of an epithelial cell. So the special model that we propose is that ARF RP1, as opposed to ARF1, uh, changes the conformation of AP1 subtly so as to expose this alternative binding pocket. Now there's no structural information to support that suggestion, it's just our, our speculation. Now, to extend this, we've shown at, for at least one other uh, protein that is a core constituent of the uh, planar cell polarity pathway, PTK7, that it also has a similar basolateral like sorting signal in its C terminus, and it also is dependent on ARF RP1 and AP1 for its traffic uh, to the cell surface. So we imagine then that these vesicles that form uh, in our model would include other molecules. Uh, bound uh, to the uh, proximal surface. So then the model, uh, at least for this part of the talk, would be that ARF RP1 and AP1 
uh, is the, at least part of the coat responsible for this, and this will require further work to establish what other elements of the coat may be essential. Now, in the remaining few minutes of, um, of the data, I want to turn to more recent experiments where we've looked at frizzled. Remember, frizzled is on the other side of the cell. It's on the uh, distal surface. And, uh, of course, it will be crucial to see if frizzled sorting in the secretory pathway depends on a distinct set of, uh, of molecules, perhaps a different ARF or ARF-like GTPase. Uh, well, the first experiment uh, to test this, Yusong did, he actually found that he could transfect HeLa cells or COS7 cells uh, with frizzled, but with another protein that also is transported to the distal surface, uh, a, a protein called Selser. It's known that these two proteins uh, bind one another, and the complex of the two is actually more efficiently trafficked to the cell surface. That is apparent in this doubly transfected cell, uh, where MYC is used to, tra uh, to mark uh, one particular paralog called frizzled 6, uh, and GFP is used to mark uh, Selser's distribution. And interestingly, in, in these transfected HeLa cells, the complex of the two proteins bound to one another travels to the cell surface and uh, forms junctions between these HeLa cells where the two proteins align along this junction. Um, in cells that are uh, exposed to uh, siRNAs against R RP1, there is no effect on the distribution of frizzled uh, and selser to this uh, adhesion region between HeLa cells. Likewise, a knockdown of the mu subunit of AP1 has no effect on the traffic of this complex to this junctional surface membrane. So these simple experiments suggested to us that um, um, Indeed, Frizzle does rely on a very different kind of machinery, independent of ARF, RP1, and AP1. So let me leave you then with one last uh, and very interesting experiment, uh, which shows that, uh, that we now actually have some evidence uh, that a novel uh, ARF GTPase may in fact be required for Frizzled. In this experiment, we've looked just at Frizzled 6HA tag. And again, in stably transfected HeLa cells, it dis it's displayed more or less uniformly about the cell surface. And among all of the ARF or ARF-like GTPases that are localized to the trans-Golgi, uh, one in particular, when knocked down, called RL1, ARF-like GTPase 1, uh, uh, causes, uh, uh, causes um, in, in this case, frizzled 6 to accumulate, again, in this structure that aligns quite nicely with the trans-Golgi marker, Golgin 97. So uh, at this point, we're on the hunt. We're looking for other effector proteins that bind specifically to RL1. And we hope by the same kind of logic to build up a set of molecules that may distinguish frizzled and, uh, um, and, and, and Vangel 2. Ultimately, what we'd like to establish is a complete reaction to measure the packaging of these two different molecules into distinct uh, vesicles that bud from a synthetic membrane. Okay, now uh, here's uh, the group, but I want to uh, highlight this uh, terrific postdoc, Yu Song Guo, uh, whose um, work I've described today. Now, I have a few minutes, and so if you bear with me, uh, I'd like to discuss something else that I spend my time doing, and that is to promote um, a new journal in the life sciences that many of you have heard of, I think from Vivek. It's called eLife. In fact, I'm quite proud of this journal. The paper, the work that I've just described is now in press in this journal. eLife started um, uh, two years ago with, in conversations between the Wellcome Trust, uh, the Max Planck Society, and then with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. These, um, um, all these very prominent funding organizations I have, in a sense, been uh, frustrated with the inability of their investigators to publish their most important work in open access, prominent journals. I think you all know uh, that the success of PLOS, and PLOS Biology, and now PLOS One, uh, has um, broken open the field of open access, and yet still only 10% uh, of the biomedical literature is published in these venues. Not enough. Uh, the organizations, Hughes, Wellcome Trust, and Max Planck, uh, encourage their investigators to publish in these journals, but for one reason or another, uh, they have not captured the imagination of postdocs and graduate students who would uh, almost uniformly prefer to send their work to the journal Cell, Nature, and Science or their spin-off journals. So um, 
We feel, uh, uh, these organizations and I feel very strongly that those very successful journals have not uh, served the community well uh, because they are modeled on a print and subscription basis, which means that they have only a limited number of pages and limited number of uh, articles that they will accept for any given issue. Science Magazine, for instance, a wonderful journal, publishes 50 pages a week. That's 50 pages covering all of the literature. And they publish most of their papers in little short advertisements of no more than a thousand or two words. So that, un unfortunately, since many of you want to publish your work in these journals, it's the, the, the journals have been a, a victim of their own success. The, the publication rate at Science Magazine is only 6%. So why is this? Why in the electronic age is one limited by a print and subscription model? We, we think this is folly. We think that there's a better way to do it. And so, um, uh, a year ago, I was asked to, to take the lead and, and start this new journal, eLife, and I've done so uh, in a model uh, of um, um, review that I'd like to share with you and encourage you to think about it for your best work. So first of all, the, unusual, the first unusual thing about eLife is that it is supported financially by these very prominent funding agencies. This is unprecedented. In, uh, in, uh, in the literature. All other journals are supported by either subscriptions or by page charges. In this case, eLife is fully funded, and at least for the next three years, since it's open access, there'll be no license fees for libraries, and there'll be no page charges for authors. But more importantly, I think, the journal is going to be run by active, um, well-established scientists. And I share with you just one list um, um, of the senior editor group that we've assembled over the past year representing very broad areas of the life sciences. I've been aided in this effort by two deputy editors, Fiona Watt of the Wellcome Trust and Detlev Weigel of the Max Planck Institute. And I think you'll recognize in your own disciplines, these are all very prominent scientists of international reputation. So what happens in eLife is when a paper comes in, it is first evaluated by one of the senior editors uh, who makes a determination about whether the, the article really has a potential impact. And by impact, I don't mean the potential to generate a lot of citations. I mean, in a, more, in a purer sense, is the work really a substantial addition to the literature? Is it a real breakthrough discovery, irrespective of the area of life science that's represented? If the decision, if, if, the, if the view of the senior editor is, yes, this is potentially very important, <clears throat> the paper is then uh, um, given over to one of a group of about 175 members of a board of reviewing editor team uh, that uh, Detlef, Fiona, and I selected. Um, each person uh, on this board uh, will serve as a primary referee for the paper that he or she is assigned. That person will then identify one or two other individuals to serve as ad hoc referees. That is just like it is as it is with most other journals. But then the, the process uh, changes at this point. Each person uh, will review the paper, including the board member. And after the reviews are collected online, the board member initiates an online consultation session where the reviewers then compare notes, uh, compare their views. And in this case, they are uh, identified to one another so that a referee that goes into this process will know that he or she has to defend his comments in this online consultation session with his peers. This takes a day or two back and forth uh, at the end, the end of which uh, the board member uh, collects the comments, assembles a single coherent decision letter in the case of a paper that's likely to be accepted, the author is then given instructions about what would be necessary to make the paper publishable. And any extraneous remarks uh, that may not be considered pertinent in the discussion, uh, the online discussion, are simply tossed and not shared with the author. So the author gets the letter, a single letter. The other reviews are, are simply left out. The author then responds. Uh, if he or she is able, the paper comes back, it goes to that board member who, having served as the primary referee, should be able on the spot to make a unilateral decision. And we've thus far been able to do that for, for the most part. That board member can then short circuit the whole process and say, you know, this doesn't cut it, or yes, they've addressed our crucial issues and we'll simply accept the paper on the spot. This allows us then to uh, short circuit the lengthy reviews back and forth that many of you have experienced. So 
um, the result is a swift process, both at the initial triage stage and then um, through the single decision format uh, with essential revisions, uh, papers can be accepted without further review. Um, thus far, we've had about 200 submissions, even though we don't actually have a journal to show for it yet. Uh, just this week, we've released the, four, the first four articles that were accepted. Uh, they are online on elifesciences.org. You can look at them if you wish. We have now, um, in sequence, the next uh, 15 or so papers that have been accepted, and they will be released over the next few weeks um, in groups of three or four. Finally, the journal will launch in December with our first full issue, uh, and um, we're very confident that this journal will capture the imagination and, uh, I hope, attention of young scholars because uh, of the streamlined review process and because we have the imprimatur of three of the most uh, notable funding agencies in the world. And so I would urge you to think about this for your most important work uh, and would be happy to answer any questions about that or about the science that I talked about. Thank you.